Hello and welcome to this DSpace Direct demonstration. I'm going to jump right into this demo DSpace Direct repository. First, I'll point out that I am accessing this account as an anonymous web browser. I am not logged into the system. First, you'll see the DSpace Direct repository branding in the top left, and then the name of the repository directly below that. As a DSpace Direct customer, you have the ability to assign uh, specialized branding and color schemes and logos to this area, as well as to uh, customize the description paragraph that you see at the top of this main screen in the repository. So several examples of additional branding um, are seen here in the Sample 1 DSpace Direct repository. You can see that the color scheme is slightly different. There's a different logo and the layout is slightly modified. Similarly, the Sample 2 DSpace Direct repository again has uh, additional customized branding. You can see a different color scheme and logo. Below the uh, description of the repository at the top of this main screen, you'll see a list of communities that have been created within this DSpace Direct repository. And then below that, you'll see the list of most recently added items submitted into the repository. Taking a moment to describe the hierarchical organization in the DSpace Direct repository, I'll note that all content, all individual items in a repository in DSpace Direct are stored in a community and then stored within a collection. So there's a three-tier hierarchical structure that must exist in every single DSpace Direct repository in order to store individual items. And again, that hierarchy is the community at the topmost level, collections within communities, and then items are submitted into those collections. Now, as a DSpace Direct customer, you can create communities and collections with any naming scheme, with any organizational structure that map to how you organize your content and collections locally. That is entirely administered by you, the customer, uh, again, through the administrative backend of the DSpace Direct repository, which I will uh, demonstrate here in just a moment. On the right-hand side of this repository, but it can also be up here on the left-hand side, um, is the main navigation area, or the uh, navigation boxes, as I call them. And these are uh, standard uh, user-facing functionality features on every single DSpace Direct instance. And again, they are available on either the left or the right of your repository. At the very top of the uh, navigation panel or box is the search capability. And this will search um, a term within your repository that matches the uh, any of the metadata fields that are attributed to items in your repository, any communities or collections that may have that term name, uh, as well as text within documents that you are storing in, uh, in your repository and then you have the ability to add additional filters in the subsequent search uh, field as well. The next box in the uh, navigation panel is the browse box. This is automatically uh, linked uh, by the DSpace Direct software and by default you can browse by communities and collections, issue date, authors, titles, and subjects. The, the results on the subsequent screen, screen are of, of course automatically uh, generated by the DSpace Direct software based on the items that you've submitted into your repository of course. Below that, you'll have the ability to either log in or register for an account within your DSpace Direct uh, repository. Uh, optionally, you can add a DSpace Direct add-on package that will allow you to integrate the uh, logins with LDAP or Shibboleth if you use those for your institutional uh, IDs at your organization. Uh, alternatively, you can use uh, DSpace Direct uh, a username and password um, out of the box as well. Below that you'll see the discover box that includes authors, subjects, and dates of issue for the most frequent items uh, in your repository. Um, so you can see flowers uh, is the most frequent uh, subject uh, affiliated with items in the repository. Uh, 
And then below that you'll see the RSS feeds that you can subscribe to to be notified when new items are added to this repository. Clicking on a community, you will see the community landing page. There's of course the name of the community in the top left. Below that, at every community landing page, you'll have the ability to browse by particular facets just within this community. And also you can search just within this community and its collections. You'll also see that the navigation boxes or panels here on the right now give the user the ability to search the entire repository or just within this community. The same is true for the browse uh, facets, so you can search and, excuse me, browse all content in the repository or browse just within this community. Of course, the My Account Login Register box is still available. The Discover box now is only representing uh, authors, subjects, and dates of issue within this uh, community and its collections. Um, and the RSS feeds are also tied just to this uh, community as well. So the boxes, uh, to summarize, are context-aware. They understand that you're at the Carissa community landing page and now are presenting options that are pertinent to just this community and the collections within it. You can also optionally uh, add uh, logos as well as descriptive text about this community on its landing page. Uh, news or a copyright statement is something uh, that you can additionally add here as well. Um, when you set up a community as an administrator, you can make these modifications through, uh, again, through the administrative interface. Below the, that information, you'll see uh, collections within this community. And one thing that I didn't mention previously is that there is one additional layer um, in the hierarchy that you can implement. It is optional, and that's the concept of a subcommunity. So you can add one additional layer into the hierarchy of content stored in your repository. So underneath a community, you could have a subcommunity. Um, and within subcommunities, you can also have collections. So you can take a three-tiered hierarchy, community collection item, and make it four tiers, community, subcommunity, collections, and items, if that is more analogous to how you organize and store your, con your content and collections locally. You can implement that here in the interface as well. Again, subcommunities are entirely optional. However, communities collections are required in order for items to be submitted into the repository. And then lastly, here on this community landing page, you'll see the list of recent submissions into this particular community. If I click on a collection, You'll see a collection landing page. It looks very similar to a community landing page. You'll have the name of the collection, the ability to browse and search just within this collection of materials. Of course, the navigation boxes are context aware yet again, so you can search just within this collection or browse by facets just within this collection or discover authors, subjects, or dates of issue just within this collection. Lastly, the RSS feeds are tied just to this collection as well. You do have the ability to add uh, additional custom text and, and a logo. Um, this is what a collection looks like without any additional customizations made, kind of a bare bones collection, if you will. And of course, you can see recent submissions to this particular collection. Clicking on an item, you'll see again the minimal uh, information uh, presented to you. Um, this item was submitted with, with only the required metadata fields that include uh, date, title, and author. Uh, a unique thing about DSpace Direct is that it mints uh, handle uh, URIs for every single uh, item that is submitted into the repository, which is available uh, directly below the name of the item, or title, excuse me, and the author. You can also see the date uh, that was attributed to this item when it was submitted into the repository. And then you can see that there is an indeed a file that was submitted or a bitstream submitted with this item uh, again when it was deposited into the repository. DSpace Direct is unique in that it allows you to submit metadata only items, metadata and individual bitstreams, either one or multiple files can be associated with an item in the repository. 
So you can have metadata only items, items with just one file attached, or items with metadata and multiple files attached. So if you have pretty complex items, they can be stored and made available here in DSpace Direct. Further, you can restrict access to the actual files themselves as an administrator uh, within the repository. So you can uh, restrict the ability to view or open files that are um, uploaded with items in the DSpace Direct repository. So I could um, not give uh, the ability for uh, anonymous uh, individuals who are accessing this Gerber Daisy item to download the Gerber Daisy.jpg image that has been uploaded. You can see that there was a thumbnail associated with this image. Uh, the majority of image uh, formats, JPEG, GIF, PNG, etc., will have thumbnails automatically generated by the DSpace Direct system. Um, of course, if you click view or open, it'll open in a new tab or prompt you to download if it's a document. And then lastly, you can see the collection or collections that this uh, item is a part of. And an item can be part of multiple collections if, if that is a requirement. You can also see the full item record that will show you all of the Dublin Core metadata fields that were inserted as part of the submission process for this item. And again, I will note that the Dublin Core metadata fields that were submitted with this item uh, were very minimal, uh, the most minimal that could be possible with uh, author, uh, title, and date um, uh, attributed to the item as part of the submission. But there are uh, a handful of other uh, metadata fields that are available, and I will walk through those in just a moment. So that is a, a quick overview of the repository uh, without having logged in. So the uh, usability um, of the repository from a anonymous web browser. Now I'm going to log in as an administrator. And there are several levels of administration that can be enabled in DSpace Direct. There is the preeminent uh, site-wide administrative capability, which is what I'm logging into right now. But you can also create uh, community administrators as well as collection administrators, um, such that you can give, for instance, a colleague who may be the chair of the physics department, the ability to administer just the Department of Physics community and its sub-collections. Um, but that person may not have the ability, if they're a Department of Physics community administrator, to make any modifications to any of the other communities in your repository. Similarly, if you have an even more restrictive use case, you can give administrative capability just to collections. And um, again, uh, those administrative capabilities uh, are at either community or collection level and they do propagate down. So anything within a community, um, so all of the sub-collections and the items um, could be administered by a community administrator. If you're a collection administrator, you can make modifications to that collection and any of the items within the collection. Um, so it does, it does propagate down. Um, but again, to summarize, I am logged in here as a, a site-wide administrator, meaning that I have all of the bells and whistles um, at my disposal. And uh, as an administrator, all of the functionality that you will be using um, is nested into the navigation box here on the right. The first uh, new uh, capability um, available to the administrator upon logging in is available in the context box, the fourth box down. Now as this box uh, very strategically notes, um, it is context aware. So at the main page of the repository, the only context aware functionality that an administrator um, can decide to take action upon is creating a community as that's the next layer down um, so you can very easily create a community by clicking at that button creating a community is very simple and straightforward um, there are several different uh, fields the name of the community is the only required field you can actually add a short description 
introductory text, copyright text, or news, as well as add a logo. Again, uh, all of those are optional with the exception of the name. And then uh, once those boxes are filled out, you simply click Create. At a community level, the context box now presents to you additional um, functionality, again, based on the fact that you're at a community landing page. So you can, of course, edit existing uh, communities. So you can edit the name, edit the description, edit the logo. You can make any modifications as a site-wide administer, administrator excuse me, uh, to this community as you need to. You can export this community, which would export all of these sub-communities, collections, items, and items metadata into a, a package that you could then download. You could export the uh, metadata only for all of the sub-communities, collections, and items within the repository, or with, sorry, within this community. Um, if you don't want the actual bit streams, you just want the metadata that you'd like to then uh, review in a local spreadsheet. You can create at this level, of course, a sub-community or a collection. And again, that uh, collection or sub-community creation form looks almost exactly the same as the create community form that I just showed. At a uh, collection level, the context box has a similar functionality. Of course, you can edit a pre-existing collection, change the name, add a logo, uh, update some of the introductory uh, descriptive text. You can export the collection or export the metadata, very similarly to what you could do at the community page. And then a very unique functionality um, aspect of the uh, collection landing page is that you can map items within this collection to other collections. So as I mentioned on um, my Gerbera Daisy item, I could map that so that it appeared to belong to other collections in the repository as well. So something to keep in mind um, that you can have items um, that are submitted into a collection appear as if they belong to multiple other collections by leveraging this item mapper uh, capability. Lastly, clicking on an item, the context box now allows you to, again, as an administrator, edit this item, export the item itself, or export just the metadata. Uh, something, a, a quick cheat uh, that I'll note is that a DSpace Direct repository keeps a breadcrumb navigation trail at the very top of the screen um, so that you can go back to any of these subsequent um, landing pages, the collection landing page, the community landing page, or the home page of the repository. So it's a good uh, tip to uh, give the user some awareness of where they are in the repository. Um, and it also allows you to navigate back to the main page uh, quickly and easily. Uh, the administrative box on the right hand side is also new um, when you log in as a site-wide administrator. That's something that is not available certainly to anonymous users. The control panel link in the administrative uh, box can safely be ignored by DSpace Direct users. It contains information that is applicable to the, uh, the person who installed the DSpace Direct repository. And again, because DSpace Direct is entirely hosted by DuraSpace staff, we're managing the DSpace configuration, the job information and the uh, current activity in terms of logs um, on the server where the repository is being uh, installed. So you can safely ignore that as a DSpace Direct customer, one of the joys of, of choosing a hosted product. Below the control panel is the access control uh, administrative uh, functions available. Um, I won't delve into uh, the specifics but you can give individual logins or people um, elevated permissions within your repository. You can promote them to be a submitter within a collection. Um, you can promote people to be, again, collection administrators, community administrators, or site-wide administrators. You can create groups. So you can create a submitter group and then lump all the uh, colleagues uh, that have are in the people list uh, into a submitter group easier to manage uh, shared, um, shared account permissions uh, with groups when you have uh, more than just a few people who will be using your repository. 
And then the authorizations um, fun function or button, function, let's combine the two words, um, in the access control list allows you to see all of the permissions and settings for all of the communities and collections um, that you've created in your repository and make modifications to those either individually or the authorizations functionality really allows you to do a lot of bulk editing of permissions. So if you have created a new group and you'd like to give that group um, the ability to submit content to seven out of the 10 communities in your, uh, in your repository, you can use this authorizations uh, functionality to bulk uh, modify permissions in your repository. Again, uh, each of these is, is very useful um, and is quite, uh, quite detailed uh, in terms of the, uh, how sophisticated you can get with adding permissions to various people or groups um, to communities and collections in your repository. In content administration, again, as an administrator, you have uh, abilities to bulk import uh, metadata forms, uh, to batch import content and auto-generate items, uh, to withdraw items from the repository. Um, if, for instance, something is flagged as objectionable, you can withdraw it entirely such that search engines won't pick it up. Um, and so you can make internal um, uh, negotiations and, and determination about what you want to do with that item. Uh, you can expunge an item from the repository. You can also have uh, private items within the repository, which may be useful if you have uh, administrative documentation that only should be available to uh, fellow administrators who log in. Um, you can leverage the private items to do that. You can see the metadata and format registries used within this repository. You can um, ignore the statistics um, button uh, as the statistics that you really want to see, and this is a good segue, are now available in the statistics box. So um, please do ignore the statistics in the administration, uh, administrative uh, panel and use the usage search and workflow statistics that are available in the statistics dedicated box. Um, and again, these statistics are available to site-wide administrators, so you can see um, uh, in, the, uh, in this case the uh, repository-wide usage statistics. Um, the statistics box is context-aware, so you can view usage, search, and workflow statistics here at the uh, repository-wide level. If you click on any of the communities or collections, the statistics box now shows you usage, search, and workflow statistics just for this particular community. Of course, this is only a very top-level view of statistics. DSpace Direct is also integrated with Google Analytics, which allows you to um, much more easily and readily, readily uh, track all sorts of uh, user activity with your repository, um, really down to minute um, details. So uh, that is something that we uh, enable out of the box with all of DSpace Direct accounts. Uh, one, one note about all of the functionality that I've demonstrated, um, it is all included as part of the subscription to a DSpace Direct, um, uh, to the DSpace Direct service. Uh, nothing that I have mentioned um, is at additional cost, so please do keep that in mind that all of this is included out of the box as uh, functionality with the DSpace Direct service. Lastly, I wanted to review how you submit an item into the repository. So there are several ways to uh, start a submission, as there are several ways to do a lot of different user-facing, um, uh, perform user-facing functions within the repository. Uh, DSpace Direct is really known for being user-friendly and giving users the ability to easily navigate to, to content um, from various different aspects um, from within the repository. So you can, excuse me while I uh, tell my auto update to go away, um, you can create a submission by going to the submissions uh, button in your My Account box. And uh, you'll also see, because I have uh, started and completed 
quite a few different submissions over time. Uh, you'll first see all the list of your unfinished submissions, so the ones you're in process on, as well as archived submissions that this uh, user has um, added to the repository over time. It's quite a few. And of course you can start a new submission by clicking start another submission now. So the first step is selecting the collection that you would like to add uh, an item into. I'm going to choose my Carissa Community Flower Photographs uh, collection and click Next. Another way to submit an item into the repository is to navigate to the community and then the collection that you would like to submit an item into. And at the collection landing page there is also a Submit button. The next screen is the default deposit screen, and this is where the uh, submitter of the item into the repository adds the metadata fields as well as uploads bitstreams if it's applicable, and then submits the item into the repository. Please do note that this, uh, the metadata fields that are captured are our Dublin Core, that is the default metadata schema that DSpace Direct uses. And many of these fields are optional, so you can choose to ignore these. At an additional cost, uh, there is a DSpace Direct add-on package called the Enhanced Submission Process Package. You can add uh, additional custom metadata fields. You can consolidate uh, the submission form um, into one page, or you can expand it into additional pages. You can change the nature of the fields. You can make drop-down boxes, etc. Again, that's something that is not included in the, the annual subscription but can be purchased uh, as an additional add-on uh, customization package. So with that, I'm going to uh, fill out some of these fields and walk through the submission process. Um, you can add uh, an author or multiple authors for an item. Uh, again, please note the author field is a required field, as well as the, uh, as well as the title field. Apologies, I can't type and talk <laughs> intelligently anyway. Um, you can add uh, as many alternative titles as there, as there needs to be captured for an item. Uh, you also need to include a date. Uh, you only need to include the year, the month and day are optional. And again, the use of the date um, in the subtext here could be the date of previous publication or public distribution. Um, the date that you want to capture here is really uh, a, a, a local policy that you can, you can set in terms of what date you want to capture. If there is a publisher, citation, or series and report number that you would like to attribute to this item, you can do so in those fields. You can also record any number of identifiers, ISS numbers, IS, ISSN, ISBN, ISMN, government document, or a, an external URI. You can capture here as well if the item um, is also stored at another, uh, at another website. You can assign a particular type to this item as well as assign it a language. And again, all of those are optional. At the very end of this first screen, you have the ability to save and exit um, the submission and come back to it at another time. And it would be listed in your uh, non-complete submissions list in your submissions page. Or you can click next, which also saves all of your entries in that field so that you can pick up where you left off if your computer just happened to crash at this point or you stepped away to a meeting. Um, you can always come back. Uh, you have the ability to add freeform keywords um, to, uh, to the submission. You can add an abstract, sponsors, or a freeform description as well. All of these, again, are optional. Um, and then at this point, you have the previous box, so you can go back and edit your submission, save and exit, of course, or cl clicking next will take you to the next screen. At this point, you have the ability, uh, again optional, to upload files. You can uh, create metadata-only items in a DSpace Direct repository. If you upload a file, you can add a description, and you can also uniquely embargo a, an individual file. Um, when you enable the embargo capability, this uh, disables um, the item from being downloadable in your repository until that date and time passes. The metadata would still be published and available for the item in the repository. 
So for instance, you could publish a student thesis. You could publish the student's name, the course, the course that it was uh, written for, and any other metadata. But you could actually embargo the thesis document itself until a certain date and time passed, at which point that file would then become available for download, even if it was five years into the future. Um, at that point, the file would then uh, become available for download automatically. If you do decide to use the embargo uh, capability, I would recommend using the embargo reason. This is an internal use only field and it would just remind you of why you embargoed that file. Um, it, it's really helpful if four years down the road and three staff changes later, uh, you have an internal uh, note or um, a way to remind uh, the user why that file was embargoed. And again, that's an internal uh, use only field. Uh, once you have completed uh, these uh, three fields, um, you can upload the file and add another. Um, or, or again, you can just ignore this uh, altogether and create a metadata only item. The uh, next step is to review all of the uh, information that you had submitted as part of the process. And of course, you can go back and correct or modify any of the uh, metadata items that you have submitted. And then assuming all of this looks accurate, you can click the next button. And the last step before submitting an item into the repository is agreeing to the distribution or deposit license. Now this is, uh, the text of this agreement is customizable um, by a DSpace Direct customer, and it is a required final step in the submission process. Uh, if you're not familiar, the di distribution or deposit license protects you, the repository owner, from the individual you've given the rights to submit content um, into your repository. It essentially um, uh, tells the user, um, informs them that they are agreeing that they have the right to submit this item into the repository, that they're the copyright owner, um, et cetera, et cetera, and it protects you um, from misuse by your submitters. If they submit something that's uh, they don't have the right to submit, you can always refer back to this deposit license from a legal perspective. Again, this deposit or distribution license, um, the text of which is entirely customizable um, by, by you, the DSpace Direct customer. So you can see there's a lot of boilerplate text in here now. But when you create, uh, when you create a collection, uh, you can uh, edit uh, this text and you can also have just a site-wide deposit license that uh, takes effect um, for all of the submissions into your repository. So you do have some flexibility there. Um, but the last step in submitting uh, an item into the repository is agreeing to this, uh, this distribution license and then completing the submission. At which point, um, in this case, the item was submitted. It went directly into the repository. However, the, the last piece of functionality that I'll just quickly touch on within DSpace Direct is the ability to enact certain uh, deposit and approval workflows. So at a, uh, at a collection level, a site-wide administrator can determine whether submissions going in um, to the repository enact a one of three different workflows or one or multiple of three different workflows. So one option is that when items are submitted, um, an email is sent to a user or a group of users who then um, are made aware that a submission has gone in and they can uh, review the submission just to make sure the metadata fields are captured appropriately. Uh, additionally, uh, uh, other workflows are available such that the item does not automatically go into the repository. It's held in a pending stage until there is an approval of the item uh, before it is then made available into the repository. That step would also um, incur emails to a particular user or group of users to uh, approve that item for submission into the repository. So again, there's uh, several uh, levels of workflow that you can enable, um, and there's uh, more detailed documentation available. Um, 
for that as well as a couple other how-to in-depth YouTube uh, tutorials. But uh, please do note that there are workflow um, capabilities enabled at the collection level within DSpace Direct. Um, again, that a demo, uh, uh, excuse me, that an administrator can uh, determine um, uh, to enable. So with that, that's a general overview of the DSpace Direct uh, repository software and service from DuraSpace. Um, if there are any uh, additional questions, um, I encourage you to email customer service at duraspace.org um, or submit a support ticket support at duraspace.org. Thank you very much.